Hello, and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'll be talking about Season 2, Episode 12, The Bus Boy. Hello, everyone. How is everyone doing out there? Oh, great. (laughs) I can't hear you. This is a podcast. I'm doing well. (laughs) Sorry, I just wanted to switch it up. I say the same thing every time when I'm saying hello to all of you. So just decided to switch it up and, well, wasn't very successful. Anyway, I'm doing okay. Not much has changed, I guess, since the last time. Uh, Today, my daughter started middle school, so it was her first day. She was very excited. She just couldn't even sleep uh, past, I think, 5.30 a.m. She came to our room and (laughs) really pumped for the new year, so very exciting. I'm excited for her, too. I'm also a little nervous for multiple reasons. Uh, Middle school can be a tough time. It was for me, certainly. But also just with everything happening with the Delta variant, leadership in this area where I live, um, I don't know, they just seem to think that masks aren't necessary. Um, You know, we're going to respect everyone's choices. Well, yeah, if your choice might uh, make a bunch of kids get really sick because, you know, there are certain kids, my kids age, who cannot get vaccinated. So that's just called being selfish. I don't really give a shit about your opinion about masks. You're not a scientist. Ooh, going off on tangents. But uh, yeah, I've um, been really frustrated and really tired. You know, I guess I'm just tired of listen or being forced to to adhere to decisions because this loud group of people who refuse to believe facts just hold all this power. It's it's really I'm just I'm just tired. I'm even frustrated and tired. But that doesn't mean I'm going to not voice my opinion or fight uh, the good fight. So it's just part of, I think, getting older, getting more aware. Uh, you can't can't let these things just kind of pass you by. You have to uh, make your voices heard. And I realize that's what the people who are anti-mask or anti-vax are doing with our school board and the people who make decisions. But to me, especially in an educational entity, <laughs> It, it is so ironic to me that instead of listening to the experts, you are giving so much power to people who don't have any expertise, but are just inconvenienced and upset about it. All right, I'm going to move on because I don't want to uh, go down this road. I will get way too upset. All right, let's get into the episode, shall we? <laughs> this week, uh, covering the bus boy, and uh, it's the technically the season finale of season two, even though it's kind of an odd way to end the season. And there are reasons for that. I've kind of gotten into that before in a couple previous episodes, especially the uh, the deal episode, um, which was originally supposed to be the finale for season two, but they switched everything around at a little switcheroo, if you will, or whatever's good for the goose is good for the gander, whatever it is. The synopsis from my coffee table book is as follows. George decides to make things right between himself and a busboy, David Labiosa. He accidentally got fired. He and Kramer make things worse by letting the busboy's cat escape during their brief visit to his home. That's it. (laughs) Nothing mentioned in this synopsis about Elaine's storyline. There were two storylines in this episode, but I guess whoever wrote this didn't feel it uh, deserved to be included in this little write-up. This episode was written by Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. We start out the first scene in a restaurant. They are eating pasta. Pasta dinners all around with George, Elaine, and Jerry. George is frustrated. He ordered pesto. Why does he order pesto? He hates pesto. Everybody likes it. Jerry doesn't like it. Jerry and Elaine are offering up their dishes and (laughs) it's very sweet, but uh, George is just overcome with how frustrated he is that he ordered pesto. Jerry sees a guy across the way in the restaurant with a hat on and uh, comments that any guy that age wearing a hat definitely got plugs. Plugs 
And I feel like maybe it was more popular in the 90s, I want to say, <laughs> or you heard about it more, uh, when men who are balding or bald receding hairlines, they would have hair from other parts of their body plugged into their uh, hairline to kind of fill in that res- recedement, receding, recit- rescendency. I'm making up words. Just like Elaine does when she sneakily looks over her shoulder to look at a painting, but really checking out the guy in his hat and says, oh yeah, plug Ola. Jerry then tells Elaine that he needs her to let the car warm up for a minute before she starts driving it. George is curious, well, what do you need the car for? Jerry says Elaine is picking up a gentleman caller (laughs) who she met when he was in town on business. He's from Seattle. His name is Ed. And they shared an interpersonal experience. Ding! On the glass. I'm assuming interpersonal experience is having sex. I'm not sure why they just couldn't say it that way. Jerry says, well, he leaves, but he learns that the Bennis tattoo doesn't wear off so easily. And she chimes in on some people. Now, George has this reaction where he goes, ooh, I'm so confused by this reaction. I don't know if when Elaine says on some people, if that's supposed to be a slight to Jerry because they broke up and so the Bennis tattoo did not stay tattooed on him. I don't know. But the ooh from George, I I guess is kind of like, ooh, you got Jerry. It's not that important to the episode. But for me, it was just confusing. I I never understood that, (laughs) that reaction. And Ed is staying with Elaine for a week. It was supposed to be a weekend, but somehow became a week. All of a sudden, George notices a fire at the next table. So he gets up pretty quickly, puts the fire out. It was a menu that was too close to the candle. George tells the manager that. He says, I think the busboy did that. Elaine jokes around and says, I'm never eating here again, after the manager apologizes to them. (laughs) Then they notice that the busboy is getting in trouble. It's getting kind of heated between the manager and the busboy. Then the busboy leaves. George feels awful. Elaine's concerned too. Oh my gosh, he must have known I was kidding. I I said it in a kidding way. Jerry didn't say anything. (laughs) The purpose of this scene, uh, it's a setup, of course. A busboy gets fired, probably because of what George said. Elaine has a male visitor who is staying with her for a week. My overall take on this scene, I always thought it was odd. And ultimately, I don't like the fact that Elaine makes Jerry tell the story of who Ed is to her and all this. I don't know why that is. It's like she's almost embarrassed about it or something. She's like, well, you tell it. I, it, I don't know. It just it seems very odd to me. I would have liked to hear JLD narrate the story, maybe with Jerry adding li- in little comments here and there instead of the other way around. I just thought that was a really odd writing choice. And this is something that I'll talk about a little bit more later, but Jerry has no storyline in this episode. So we've set up both of the storylines. I guess I would say that the busboy storyline is the A story. Well, obviously, it's <laughs> the episode is named after it, and it definitely gets more uh, airtime. And then also the boyfriend staying with Elaine. Kramer eventually just hops on to the George storyline, and we'll get to that in a little bit as well. But yeah, Jerry kind of remains independent of each. He is sort of the counsel for both of them. But yeah, there's really nothing just independent for Jerry in this episode. The next scene, we're back at Jerry's apartment. It's later that night. George is still worried. Oh, man. And he's making (laughs) a ginormous sandwich. And I I get so distracted because I believe it looks like like a sandwich with deli meat. So like turkey or ham or something. And he's putting ketchup on it. Is that a thing? It seems very odd to me. Mustard, yes. But I've never really... I, I've, I don't think I've ever seen it. Mayo, mustard, yes, but ketchup on a deli sandwich? Huh, very odd to me. But then again, it's George, and I don't think he has a lot of restrictions on what he eats. <laughs> and I guess he's making the sandwich too, because he hated his pesto, and he didn't really eat anything at the restaurant, so he needs this ginormous sandwich with ketchup on it. Elaine buzzes and enters with a lot of excitement because she's one clever chickadee. She obtained the address of the busboy using charm, which means nothing to Jerry. (laughs) She also needs the keys so she can go pick up Ed. George decides he's going to go to the busboy's place. He can't live with himself. And Jerry convinces him to take Kramer. Since Elaine can't go, she's got to go to the airport. And so, yeah, take the (laughs) K-man. George is hesitant, but 
figures, well, it's better to be safe in numbers. The purpose of this scene is to move this busboy story forward. So we know George is heading out to uh, confront him and, and apologize. My overall take, uh, just to get a little bit more into the busboy storyline and George as a character, it's very rare to see George be so unselfish and compassionate for this busboy. I guess the other time, and I was reminded of this as I was making my notes, where he's truly concerned about someone else like someone else's comfort or well-being is when he wants to provide a chair for the security guard at Susan's uncle's store, Ross's. Um, But this one has like a weightier feel to it. I mean, George is very emotional about it. And yeah, like he says, I won't be able to live with myself if he doesn't apologize and and somehow help this busboy. It's, It's a rare side of George that we don't see, I don't think, again, <laughs> except in maybe little little pieces here and there. But yeah, this is a, this is a kind of a heavy uh, compassion episode for George. I like that Elaine had her own part to fulfill in getting the, the busboy's address because she also felt some guilt and some responsibility with her joking comment of, I'm never eating here again. So we see Elaine's involvement in the busboy storyline sort of end here, and now she's moving on to her gentleman caller, Ed, staying with her. All right, uh, Elaine's not in the next couple of scenes, but we'll just go over them real quick. The next scene, George and Kramer arrive at the busboy's apartment. Uh, super awkward. The busboy's clearly pissed. <laughs> George is trying to apologize. And then Paquita, the cat of the busboy, goes missing because la puerta está abierta, which if any of you didn't take high school Spanish like me, that means the door is open. So that is how the cat got out. The next scene, just a continuation in the <laughs> busboy's apartment. They're all sitting around the table. Not saying much. Kramer is trying to make him feel better about the cat, saying, you know, they got things in their brains. They, they could come back unless someone starts feeding your cat. That's what you got to worry about. George gives the busboy his card and apologizes for it all. The job, the cat, and then the lamp that Kramer breaks as he's apologizing. The next scene is in Jerry's apartment. It's a time jump. It's a week later. Jerry's on the phone with George. He still feels so awful about everything. Elaine buzzes. She enters in a tizzy. She's in a hurry. She needs to get the keys and some aspirin. (laughs) We get a look it when she asks, look it, can you guarantee that this car can get me to the airport tomorrow? (laughs) Jerry's just confused. What is going on? Then she says, oh, I can't believe how much I hate this guy. She explains she needs to get him out of her life and on this plane tomorrow. And it's not him. It's the situation. He's a wonderful guy, but I hate his guts. Jerry asks if they've been having sex, and she says, no, I've told him I've been having my period for the last five days. But she's determined, only 14 more hours, and he will be out of her life. Jerry does ask about the alarm clock, though. (laughs) I think this is a nice runner throughout the series. Elaine's alarm clock has been an issue (laughs) since they were a couple. It's mentioned here. Then, of course, it's mentioned when Jean-Paul Jean-Paul is staying with her. But she says, nope, got a new one. If you don't get up, it slaps you in the face. <laughs> Purpose of this scene, we're moving the boyfriend storyline forward. And we we learn that Elaine cannot stand having Ed at her place. And we also see a hint that George is still torturing himself over the busboy incident. I find this scene frustrating. I wish we got to see more of this Ed and Elaine interaction. Whenever I watch this scene, I'm just left wanting more details about why she hates him so much. And she hints that it's, oh, it's the situation. She's scrunched up on one side of the bed, but uh, I need more. It just, it's a huge jump, I feel like, story-wise. And if we're going to talk about swapping scenes, which I've talked about, (laughs) the scene swap op, I guess I'll call it, opportunity. This is where I think we could have scrapped that second busboy apartment scene for an Ed and Elaine scene. I think that second scene in the apartment is really unnecessary and it drags on. So if we could have just had some kind of a display about what it is that's really bugging Elaine about this guy versus just a quick line about, it's the situation. I don't know. It just seems like a big extreme and like we'd missed a scene at least an opportunity for a scene. Performance-wise, it's totally fine. I mean, I like how JLD plays it. Now, it's not a 
faceless suitor situation, which I've mentioned in earlier episodes where Elaine would just talk about a boyfriend and we'd never see him. We do get to see this boyfriend, but we don't see what this buildup was to the situation in the next scene uh, where, where they've overslept. So it's not a faceless suitor situation. I'm calling it a faceless conflict situation. It's not the best term, but it's what I'm calling it. It's what I came up with. So the next scene is Elaine's bedroom. Oh, God, they overslept. It's 9.15. Ed keeps just saying he's so slow. He's like, yeah, I'll just go tomorrow or the next day. And she's just frantic, trying to get him dressed, trying to get him packed. She's not listening to anything he's saying. <laughs> she just keeps insisting, no, you have your ticket. You have to go today. You have to go now. He wants to shower. No way. Oh, he's got cashews. Nope, you're not getting your cashews. <laughs> then where's my brown sweater? What? And she's just like, what the hell is she? She just throws her brown sweater because it's brown. <laughs> well, the purpose of this scene, we see this desperate, desperate attempt for Elaine to get out of the house and get him out of her life, even though I believe his flight, from what he says, the flight takes off at 10. He's like, it takes 40 minutes to get to the airport. And that leaves me five minutes to get on the plane. It's impossible. So <laughs> shut up and pack. Overall, I think this is a fantastic display of physical comedy by Julie Louis-Dreyfus. I'll definitely get into that more when I'm covering the extras, but I just have to say it's it's masterful. I love it. It's uh, messy enough. It's it's just like her face is just crinkled the whole time. She You can just tell she's, she's just in a panic and she knows she's acting crazy, but she doesn't care and just running around. I mean, I can't even imagine how tiring that must have been, which she does talk about in the commentary. So I'll get to that in a little bit. I love Ed, who's played by Doug Ballard. He is so good. Just so slow and do do do. It's okay. You know, just complete opposite the straight man that's necessary for Elaine to counter Elaine just going nuts and needing to get him out of there. Fun fact for any of you Dark Knight fans out there, Doug Ballard played the businessman who was in one of the fairies at the end of the Dark Knight. And he was the one that speaks up in favor of blowing up the other fairy that's full of convicts. You know, he said, those men had their chance. He has this sort of dramatic monologue about why they should be the ones to live and not the convicts when the Joker sets up that moral dilemma for both of those fairies. Oh, I just love that movie, by the way. And so anyway, Doug Ballard plays that man. <laughs> he's pretty, he looks very different. And, this, you know, in Seinfeld, he's got that hair almost like Jack Tripper hair a little bit in, in uh, this this episode of Seinfeld, but he's he's pretty bald in, in uh, The Dark Knight. Excellent in both roles, I have to say. He's been in a lot more than just, <laughs> yeah, he went from Seinfeld and then he waited like 25 years and was in The Dark Knight. No, uh, has a lot of uh, great credits to his name. And I just thought he was so great as this straight man, <laughs> Ed to uh, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, especially in this this crazy scene where she's trying to get him frantically packed up and out of her apartment. And, and that's just all the more reason. I mean, given how funny their relationship was and their performances are, uh, you know, Doug Ballard as Ed and the genius of Julia Louis-Dreyfus, another scene with the two of them would have just really helped justify how frantic she is in this uh, scene in the bedroom. I mean, the last scene where Elaine tells Jerry about how much she hates him and wants him out, that does inform why she's so crazed in this scene. And again, she's such a great actress that in that scene, you do see she's like hunched over. Oh, you can't believe how much I hate this guy and taking aspirin. So it's all there in the performance to inform why she's this um, panicked in this scene. But just being the selfish JLD fan that I am, <laughs> a scene where we would get to see Elaine irritated at this guy for maybe just normal things because she does say, oh, it's not the situ it's not him, it's the situation. Sort of letting the audience in a bit deeper and getting more invested by witnessing a dilemma versus just hearing about it. That's something I would have appreciated. Nevertheless, this is a very funny scene and JLD kills it. Her physical comedy chops really come through for the first time in the series in this scene, and it's genius. The next scene is at Jerry's apartment. George and Jerry are hanging out. They're talking about toilets in the city. 
the start of this whole vein of George knowing where to go to the bathroom in the city. I mean, it even gets extended out to the Curb episode where they do the Seinfeld reunion episode where he had invented the iToilet, the app that will tell you the best toilets in New York City. And this is 100% a Larry David trait uh, that was pretty obvious from the commentary. Then we get this dramatic entrance from Elaine with a sweeping camera shot zooming in on her. She's disheveled. She's in that nightgown. She's wearing the jacket over it. She's barefoot. And then Elaine has this monologue about the drive to the airport, how she was almost kind of out of her body driving. <sighs> but then the five car pileup on Rockaway Boulevard prevented her from making it on time. And he missed the flight she breaks down at the end, and I love the way she says that downstairs. <laughs> really funny. Then Kramer busts in. The bus boy is coming. Now, the bus boy has his own monologue. I have like two monologues in this scene. The restaurant from which he was fired had an explosion. Five people died in his section. He would have been there that night. George saved his life. Plus, he got another job, and Paquita returned. Ed buzzes. He's coming up. The bus boy and Ed get into a fight in the hallway, and we only hear it. We don't see it, but it sounds pretty ugly. Purpose of this scene, we find out that Elaine didn't make it to the airport, and the bus boy is happy now. Well, that doesn't last long because both of the storylines converge. Ed and the bus boy get into a fight. Overall, okay, it's complicated, <laughs> my thoughts about this scene. Performance-wise, I have zero issue. Uh, JLD does, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> I don't really love the writing in this scene. Um, the monologue for Elaine was rough for me. Um, it goes on for too long, in my opinion. It's not, I guess, it's not a very long monologue, but it felt long. And I think it was just because I didn't really care for the writing. It's just not interesting for me at all. And the only moment, like I said, that I liked was at the end when she says, downstairs. I guess sometimes less is more. And I think that applies here, especially when I believe we could have gotten more out of this storyline with just an additional scene involving Ed and Elaine. I'm saying it again. And then we get like just a minute later, another, in my opinion, too long of a monologue from the busboy. It messed with the pacing of it. And I just didn't really care for either monologue, to be honest. And it just, uh, I don't know, it made it all fall flat for me. The collision of the storylines was fine. I mean, I do like how the fight was off screen, but it also, <laughs> it did seem to come out of nowhere. I mean, we get a bit more info on Ed, I suppose. He seems to have an anger issue. I mean, we already knew the busboy was very intense and definitely seemed like he could get into a fight at a drop of a hat. But it does seem a little bit forced to me, like they needed a button for the end of the scene. So, hey, a fight. Yeah. <laughs> Eh, seemed a little lazy in my opinion. The final scene, we're at Monk's with uh, Jerry, George, and Elaine. It's kind of a bookend to the first scene with them all sitting at uh, a restaurant. Uh, Ed is still in town because he got super injured in that fight. He can't eat solid foods. Elaine is taking care of him. George has to leave because he has to feed the cat, Paquita, because he's taking care of the cat. <laughs> he's sort of the bus boy's caretaker, just like Elaine is Ed's caretaker after this hallway fight that they got into. This is our resolution scene, as the end scenes usually are. And my overall take is a solid meh. <laughs> okay, well, let's take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Hi, honey. Huh. Oh, what are you wearing? Oh, it's new. Do you like it? Like it? You look so... Oh, sexy and comfortable. <laughs> Traditional lingerie not for you? You're not alone. For some of us ladies, we feel sexiest when we're covered from neck to toe. If that describes your ideal night of intimacy, then you need the Mighty Nighty. You've heard of Mini, Midi, Maxi. Well, now there's Mighty. From the makers of chic shoulder pads and velvet vixen suits, the Mighty Nighty is for the modest woman who harbors a sexy tomcat inside. 
While other lingerie brands live by the less is more creed, we at Mighty Nighty believe that most is more. Every inch of hemline is ruffled, from the pleated collar bib to the extra-long puffy sleeves. You could be a pirate. Made from thin white cotton, the Mighty Nighty can also double as a sheet for a crib mattress, because we believe in subtle, sexy sustainability. Leave 100% to the imagination of your beloved when you step out in your Mighty Nighty. We put the long in lingerie. And we're back. So there were a few extras on this episode. We had an inside look where Larry David talks about the merging of the storylines and how it was actually accidental, but that he loved it. And it really pointed him in the direction of doing that um, as often as possible. Worlds collide. Storylines collide. Jerry's generosity is mentioned by a couple people in the inside look, Jason Alexander being one of them. I mean, the fact that he had no (laughs) storyline. One of the producers took him aside and said, you're you're being too generous here. I mean, the show is called Seinfeld. (laughs) But Jason Alexander said, look at, I mean, that's just how generous he was with letting the co-stars shine. And he never had an issue with that. I thought that was really sweet. Julia Louis-Dreyfus in the inside look. She mentions that the bedroom scene was a big scene for her, but it was very emotionally and physically exhausting. I think she mentioned that they did it three times. And uh, yeah, you get the sense. She doesn't say it here in the interview, but she was not happy with her performance. So let's move on to the commentary kind of on that theme. It's Jason Alexander, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, and Michael Richards doing the commentary for this episode. And I guess I'm just going to focus on the common theme of how much (laughs) Julia Louis-Dreyfus just seemed to hate to watch herself in this one. She hates her hair, her clothes, her makeup, and most of her performance. She just keeps saying, oh, God, oh, God, what is that? What was that choice? She does point out how that line about the period was huge. Now, yeah, I wanted to talk more about that. I was waiting until we got to this point, but I went off on a little bit of a tangent about uh, in the baby shower episode about how we should be more open about talking about periods, especially with our sons. And so, yeah, that line where she said that she had been lying to Ed about having her period for five days, she said that was pretty huge. JLD commented on that and said, yeah, I mean, that that was a big deal to actually say the word and to admit that as a woman on a sitcom. It just wasn't done. And then they moved on. I really wish they would have discussed that more. I think Jason Alexander kind of gave a huh after she said that. But then they just kept moving on. But uh, yeah, I, I loved that that was mentioned in the commentary. But I really like that they kept it in the episode as well. And it does spark the debate about period sex, no period sex. Uh, That's a whole different, I think, podcast. But (laughs) I've had many conversations with friends, both male and female, about opinions about period sex. All I will say is that I've never felt more old or out of touch when I expressed that I've never had period sex. And all the younger folks around me were like, what? Like looked at me like I was an alien. So I was like, oh, is that, that's just a thing now? Okay. Well, I guess I'm more from JLD or Elaine's generation where, yeah, that was the way to get out of it. (laughs) Men will be just repulsed by it. Wow. That's a lot of information. Excuse me if that was just TMI, but hey, you know what? We're on a journey here together on this podcast and I feel, I feel comfortable enough to say this. Mostly because I'm just standing in my closet alone. (laughs) So as they got to the bedroom scene and they were doing the commentary, again, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is just uh, moaning and groaning. Oh, God, this scene, uh, you know, and and I have to say, Michael Richards, who is, I think we can all agree, the kind of physical comedy master of Seinfeld, he kept telling her it was good. He was like, no, Julia, this is good. You were, this is funny. You were really good. But she's just denying it and saying, oh, God, no, no. 
And she points out that she missed an opportunity to do something really fun when she's putting on Ed's pants, which I thought was a funny moment where she's trying to put his pants on for him. Then he finally just kind of takes over. But she she made it seem like, see, I, I could have done something so much better there. I, I just missed an opportunity. Oh, I don't even I hate watching this. This is not a good process. So I don't know what she meant by that or what she felt like she could have done but uh, clearly she was she was not um, not thrilled with the pants choice and just kind of it the whole thing in general but both Jason Alexander and Michael Richards kept telling her this is fun you're hilarious you're doing an amazing job and I really think coming from Michael Richards that she should take that as a high compliment but she was a little bit too just kind of in her head hating watching this episode then we get to the monologue scene this is where JLD, I mean, she just, ref- it's, it's the most extreme reaction. She refuses to watch it. You can hear her voice move away from the mic. Jason Alexander is kind of making the commentary. And you can tell he kind of turns away and he's like, oh, yeah, she's not even watching. She's like, no, no, no. She sounds a little far away. She's like, no, I'm not. I can't. I can't do it. And Jason Alexander, and this is where I love the honesty, just the, the brutal honesty of it all. He doesn't criticize her performance, but he does acknowledge, he goes, Jules, this is a tough monologue. Most people, 99% of people have no idea what the fuck you're talking about because you're saying specific streets in New York and highways. Like, unless you're a New Yorker, this isn't interesting. Like, this is a tough monologue to pull off. You had a, this was a tall order for you. And so I kind of liked that honesty of like, okay, I get it. And I think just as actors, they just get it. It's it, no matter what, you're not going to convince the other person who is their own, you know, worst critic. I think we can all agree uh, about that. <laughs> we're, we're all like that in some respect. And no matter what you do for a living, we're, we're all our own worst critics. So Instead of trying to convince her, he's just said, hey, look, this was this was not an easy monologue to pull off for, for anyone. So I kind of I, I kind of appreciated the fact that he was <laughs> making her well, trying to make her feel better about it. When the episode was ending, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, she just says the best scenes in the whole episode were the ones at the busboy's apartment. Like you two, George and Kramer, who they also say weren't paired up very often together, just the two of them. She said that was that was gold. And uh, she so she gave them their props going like, look, you guys had the funniest, definitely the funniest moments of the entire episode, even though she had a full monologue and a full scene of pure physical comedy. And I'm going to disagree with you, JLD. Sorry. Um, They were okay, but they certainly didn't need two of those scenes. In the notes about nothing, they mention that the episode aired last because, well, NBC didn't like how Jerry didn't have a storyline like we talked about. They sort of held it off. And, And I did notice the air date was a month after the last episode. So the Chinese restaurant aired, I think, May 23rd, and this aired June 26th of 1991. So it was not only just kind of held back, but I think I didn't really look into what what the delay was. So it was almost a full month later. So it really was kind of buried at the end. Also in the notes about nothing, sometimes they will include some of the dialogue that was in the original script or at the table read, but ended up getting cut out. So somewhere in the episode, there was an exchange between Jerry and Elaine where he's brushing his teeth and sort of bragging about his technique saying, oh, these concentric circles, you notice that they're not as abrasive. And Elaine's response, which I thought was awesome, and I wish they would have included it maybe in another episode is, you're a man of colossal ego in the most irrelevant matters. Such a great line. There was a quote from JLD from an interview where she just admits to being a total clown growing up. She says, everybody's funny in my family. We're a genetically funny family. So nobody was surprised when I became a professional actor. Back to JLD hating her performance, specifically about the monologue. She felt that the deadpan stare that Elaine has throughout that monologue was a terrible choice. She That is the part, and I think that's why she couldn't watch it during the commentary, that deadpan stare was just a terrible choice in her opinion. While, you know, many fans feel it's a great early Elaine moment. I personally... I again, I don't think it's a great moment just because not because of her performance. I don't mind the deadpan stare. Honestly, it's just the writing to me is not great for that monologue. And I I think the great early Elaine moment for me is just the entire oversleeping bedroom scene. 
Then they have this quote from JLD, again, I think from an interview about how the cast of characters is pretty pathetic on Seinfeld. She says, we are all friends who don't treat each other that well. There's one crisis after another, lying, scheming, getting the other guy into all kinds of trouble. George is a cheapskate, always trying to make us pay for things. Kramer is a mooch, always using us. Jerry's problem is that he hangs out with us. And Elaine's problem is that she needs to get a better job, needs a little bit more focus in her life. I think that sums it up pretty well. I do think Elaine was too influenced by these idiots. (laughs) And they brought out the worst in her. And trust me, I love that. I mean, it makes that's what makes the show so great. But to JLD's point, if she was a little bit more focused in her life, perhaps she would have found a better lot to hang out with, <laughs> which she kind of tries to do in the Bizarro episode. But uh, I think it, she's too far gone. She, the influence is too deep in her soul. And, uh, you know, they couldn't accept her because <laughs> she's a little selfish with those olives and pushing Kevin and everything that happens. All right, let's move on to Contributor Corner. Greg has some great comments about this episode. First, he says, I love the opening scene in the restaurant. It all feels very real. Talking about pesto, a fellow eater in a baseball hat, getting hair plugs, and then on to Elaine's house guest. Jerry's line about the Venice tattoo does not wash off so easily is just brilliant writing. On most shows, dinner conversations are usually on one serious topic, but here it's just friends BSing and that's how life really is. Yeah, I I, I do like that scene. But like I said, I'm not crazy about the fact that Jerry has to explain (laughs) who Ed is. But yeah, I did. I think that Benis tattoo line is really, really good. But that could have been an interjection to her, you know, kind of leading the story. I'm really not going to get off this whole thing. But I yeah, that that's my complaint about that scene. But yes, it is very real, very, you know, there's not um, just kind of one topic, they kind of go all over the place. And And I, of course, I love a good George rant. So the rant about pesto was fantastic as well. Greg goes on to say, I really like how when the busboy gets fired, George and Elaine both feel awful about it. But Jerry jokes it off. The follow up scene in Jerry's apartment where Elaine comes in with all the information on the busboy and how she used her charm to get it. She's very confident in herself. And it's fun to see how Jerry kind of dismisses it. Elaine is so high on Ed the house guest's pending arrival that it doesn't burst her bubble at all. Yeah, I did. I thought that was interesting that Elaine felt any kind of responsibility about it. I mean, but I do like the contrast between her and George's reaction to Jerry just being like, I don't say anything. (laughs) Next, Greg says, I have to mention the wardrobe on both George and Kramer when they visit the busboy, specifically George's hideous hat with snowflakes that look like coronavirus cells on it. Ooh, topical with a big poof ball on top, coupled with a hideously thick scarf that's wrapped around his neck many times over. Kramer looks like he borrowed Doc Brown's lab coat and paired it with the Harley Davidson shirt for some reason. This scene goes on for far too long, and there's not enough comedy in it. Between the missing cat and the broken lamp, I'd rather see how things are going with Elaine and Ed. Whoa! Yes! (laughs) Sorry if I just blew out your ears. If you've missed it before, I read these real time. So I have not read Greg's comments before this moment. So (laughs) what I've been mentioning tirelessly and probably too many times about how we needed more Ed and Elaine and less of this busboy apartment shit. um, Ah, Greg just totally (laughs) validated all my feelings. Yes. And yes. Okay. So I've already gone over that. But uh, the, the wardrobe is weird. That hat, like, are you three? What is that hat? Um, during the commentary, they kind of say something that they don't go very deep into it, but they go, Oh, look at that hat. And then Kramer, or sorry, Michael Richards does say oh, the Harley Davidson shirt. And it seems he has a different outfit from when he uh, is so excited to go, take me where, take me where, um, to, you know, this arrival at the busboy's apartment. So it's like, did he change? It just seemed a little odd and the continuity was off there, but... <laughs> Yeah, at, at any rate, the both outfits are not great. All right, moving on, Greg says, the focus on the busboy storyline overshadows Elaine's house guest subplot, which is disappointing. Her being unhappy with this guy should have been shown in real time and not just her recounting why it's not going well. They do a much better job with this plot when they use it again later with the British bounder Elaine flies in, who gets the Armani suit from Banya. As far as we know, Ed is not a bad guy, so it's hard to understand what truly has gone wrong. 
Yes, thank you. This is all, I feel, I feel like I'm in a cave. This is all these echoes are coming back to me from Greg. <laughs> I'm saying it, it's coming back to me in Greg's voice. Um, yes, exactly. I, I can't agree more. And thank you for bringing up the British Bounder because yes, it's like, it's almost like they, they remembered that story and they were like, let's do it again, but let's actually show why this guy is so annoying to Elaine. It still would have been a little bit different because I think, as she says, Ed isn't a bad guy. It's just the situation. So seeing that in real time would have been helpful to us. <laughs> All right, Greg's next comment. All that's said about Elaine's weak subplot, she delivers a millionfold with her performance of trying to get Ed ready to leave when the alarm clock doesn't go off. I wonder how many times they shot this because she must have been so out of breath by the end of it. This is done in all one take, it appears, and she is at an 11 the entire time. Of course, yeah. Ah, more echoes coming back to me. Yes, Greg. She absolutely takes what she's given and just elevates it to no end. I've said that over and over, but this is a great example of that. She doesn't get to show one-on-one -on -one with Ed what's happening in real time with the kind of disintegration of this week-long trip. But man, do we see her give it all in this scene. And uh, to answer your question, which I already did, they, it looks like they did it three times, she mentions in the commentary. So, but still, three times doing all of that at, at an 11, like you said, very physically exhausting and emotionally exhausting, like she said in the Inside Look interview. Finally, Greg says the scene of Elaine walking into Jerry's in her nightgown and a coat, hair a mess and shell-shocked from her drive is classic. She calmly explains what happens en route to the airport, and it's fun to hear this and be able to now relate to it now living in NYC because getting to the airports is a nightmare. The highways here are so tight with no shoulders, when there is an accident, the whole thing really does shut down. They make so many references in the series to getting to and from the airports, but it's almost always George who is doing the driving, so I enjoyed this time where it's Elaine having that experience. George would have told this story in an over-the-top way with big arm movements. Elaine does it the complete opposite, and it works so much more effectively for her. She seriously could have gotten an Emmy for these last two scenes alone. Okay, yes. I mean, I completely see where you're coming from, Greg. It's And it's interesting, again, that you mention that this monologue has more meaning to you now that you live in New York City and you understand all those references or the, the street names that they're talking about. And, and uh, like you said, the reference to these highways. And so totally makes sense that you're enjoying that. And I, it still doesn't really work for me. I, I don't think the writing is very strong for it, like I said earlier, but I appreciate what she did with it because you're right. It, it, it would be, I wouldn't want to see her do it or, or perform it like George and, uh, sometimes I look up the scripts online. They have a website where it's, um, they have the actual scripts. And so it is in the script where she walks in in sort of this kind of dreamlike haze or state. So that is why she delivers it like that. And I do think it's effective. Contrary to how JLD feels about it, she hates that choice. It's so interesting to me. Uh, I'd love to like really talk to her about that. <laughs> Maybe someday I will. But yeah, I think that we needed to see how Elaine would feel about it versus her trying to do a monologue like George. And I actually have some commentary later comparing this to a George monologue. But yes, I, I do think performance wise, she's she's fantastic. Uh, the monologue for me is more of a writing issue. No, no doubt about it that that physicality of the oversleeping alarm clock, getting to the airport, frantic packing scene, Emmy worthy, no doubt about it. Thank you so much, Greg. Always love your comments. If you would like to become a contributor to this show, please email me at elainepodcast at gmail.com. That's elainepodcast at gmail.com. You will receive emails about which episodes I'm covering, when I need your comments by, how I can receive your comments, and someday your comments might be on this podcast. All right, my favorite Elaine moments. Well, <laughs> I don't know how many times I can mention it, but no surprise, the entire scene in the bedroom. She really makes a meal out of all that physicality and it works. I mean, despite what she thinks. <laughs> and I guess within that scene, my favorite within the favorite is just that like hopping around when he's asking about the brown sweater. <laughs> you just feel that urgency. It's almost like a, I got a pee dance and it's that's my favorite, favorite like moment of the entire episode. My final notes. Overall, I think it's a very so-so episode. 
we do get an Elaine storyline, but it's not served very well when it comes to developing the Ed and Elaine dynamic. And like I said, I feel like they jumped from that excitement of her picking him up in the beginning to completely hating him. That entire plot line could have been better served if there was a justifying scene somewhere in the middle where we really did understand why she needed to get him out and why she hated him so much. And they had time to do it. Second busboy apartment scene. Big ol' waste of time. Julia Louis-Dreyfus's performance is top-notch. I mean, there's no surprise there. But I am a bit surprised hearing how negatively she felt about herself in this episode during the commentary. I mean, even the monologue, which she couldn't watch. I mean, my main criticism is the writing and not that deadpan stare or her general delivery. I like that she's sort of in a trance. It kind of fits the madness of the day. But, you know, I have to agree with what Jason Alexander mentions, that the content of the monologue was so uninteresting, naming the roads and highways, etc., Um, unless you're a New Yorker, and we got an account from an actual New Yorker, Greg, so (laughs) he likes it because he understands it. Just comparing this monologue from this episode um, from Elaine to one of the most famous and most brilliant monologues of the series, where George has to get the golf ball, it's a marine biologist, he has to get the golf ball out of the blowhole of the beached whale, if you compare the writing, I mean, it's similar in tone when you talk about dramatic language, like the sea was angry that day, my friends, like an old man trying to return soup at a deli. And with her monologue, I was going faster than I've ever gone before. And yet it all seemed to be happening in slow motion. So there's this tone of dramatic imagery, you know, with both. While I love specificity, I have mentioned it before, I love specificity. I think the inclusion of details is way more effective when it's relatable details. So that that to me is the big difference here. Plus, we did see a buildup to the whole marine biologist thing and how much George wanted to impress the woman he was on a date with and all that stuff. So there was a little bit more buildup. So that monologue was definitely more effective. But <laughs> so there are so many different elements as to why I think the Elaine monologue doesn't work for me, but that George one does. So yeah, overall, it's a very middle of the road episode for me. Best I can describe my feelings about it. I mean, if I were scrolling channels and this episode was on in syndication, I'd I'd probably keep going, to be honest. And I love Seinfeld, but I'd be like, eh, it's a busboy. Let's see if there's a a good Law & Order SVU on. (laughs) And I think that's all I can say about the busboy. Thank you so much for listening. Ah, we're moving on to season three next week. I'm so excited. Uh, I'm so happy that I've kept this going. (laughs) A little personal props to myself. (laughs) But if you know me and you know my past with getting overwhelmed or maybe just, I don't know, getting a little bit inconsistent with my efforts, getting to 17 episodes of this podcast is a huge source of pride for me. So then thank you for joining me on this journey. And I'm so excited to keep going uh, next week. Yes, season three. So please keep listening. And I will see you next time.